privacy is one of those non-textual constitutional rights. It doesn't appear, the word privacy doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. Um, and if you're looking for a justification, you, you don't have to look that much further than the Ninth Amendment, which acknowledged that there would be rights that are, are not enumerated, that are not listed in the Constitution, but that would nonetheless be considered constitutional rights that stay with the people. Uh, be that as it may, uh, privacy in particular is one of those concepts that even though it's not mentioned in the Constitution, is extremely important to us. And this is from a variety of perspectives, uh, perhaps most controversially, uh, reproductive privacy. Okay, the entire, uh, the ability to get uh, contraceptives, uh, the ability to get abortions in appropriate circumstances, what sort of regulations the state can put on abortions. There's been a huge, huge amount of case law, the development of the law of privacy within the concept of reproductive health. That's extremely important to people. Um, but privacy also exists in terms of the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable searches and seizures. It also exists, uh, strangely enough, in that much maligned and sometimes joked about Third Amendment. Think about this. One of the reasons you can't quarter troops in people's homes, except under fairly specific circumstances according to law, is because that's a huge intrusion on people's privacy. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, right against uh, self-incrimination. Uh, you don't have to talk about things that you don't want to that might tend to incriminate you. So the concept of privacy exists all throughout the Bill of Rights and indeed at other points in the Constitution as well. And uh, the only curious thing about it is that the founders didn't actually decide to put it in there because it's so important and so essential to our form of government and to our happiness as individuals that uh, I think it's pretty clearly established as being a fundamental constitutional right. The First Amendment with the right to associate and uh, the right to freedom of speech and even the sort of more uh, non-explicit right to freedom of thought really implies that there's a right to privacy. There's also the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, which basically says that this list of rights isn't exclusive. And some people have said that in understanding the fundamental, uh, the fundamental structure of a free society, there has to be a right to privacy that's free from government intrusion. So there, are, there, are, there have been over the years understandings of the uh, different bases for the understanding of the right to privacy, but it's pretty clear that the courts understand that there's a right to privacy inherent in many different uh, provisions of the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment, in fact, does imply a right to privacy. So the Fourth Amendment has been interpreted in a way that suggests that there are, there's a penumbra of privacy rights that the government cannot encroach on. The major case in this area was actually a, um, the, the major case in the Fourth Amendment privacy area is a case that had to do with uh, contraception. So uh, there was a time in our not too distant past that uh, sodomy laws were present, uh, contraception, contraception laws were present, and the question was how are these laws to be enforced? So let's take Let's take sodomy as one example. Uh, sodomy was illegal in a number of states and although not enforced anymore, it's still uh, illegal in some states. Uh, so the question was uh, that someone was arrested uh, in his home uh, for the act of sodomy. And the Supreme Court had to decide whether or not uh, this was a proper uh, entrance into the house and, and, and was a proper arrest. So. The Supreme Court ended up saying that this law could not be reasonably enforced because it would imply that the government could essentially kick down someone's door and go into their bedroom and observe the personal and private, intimate moments of people's lives. So the Supreme Court said there is a zone of privacy. They called it a penumbra uh, around the individuals that cannot be pierced by the state. So privacy has been interpreted to be a central tenet of the Fourth Amendment. And so the landmark case was a case that the Supreme Court encountered in the 1960s, um, Katz versus United States. And what happened in Katz was that the FBI, wanting to overhear the conversation of Charlie Katz, who was a bookmaker in Los Angeles, followed him to a telephone booth and placed a microphone on the top of the telephone booth and overheard Charlie's end of the conversation when he was talking to another bookie in Florida. And when the Katz case came to the United States Supreme Court, um, the government argued 
there was no search because there was no invasion of any of Charlie Katz's property. He didn't own the phone booth. He didn't own the top of the phone booth. And so he couldn't say the government had trespassed on anything the law of property protected. And it's the Katz case where the court gave us the concept that we use today to define a search and one that has allowed us to move into the digital digital age, and it's a concept that says a search is action by the government that invades your reasonable expectation of privacy. So if the government wiretaps, they overhear a conversation that I have with someone else that I expect to be private, that society expects to be private, the government can't do that unless it meets the procedure that is spelled out in the Fourth Amendment, because that's an invasion of a reasonable expectation of privacy. On the street, for an officer, the formula for unreasonableness is so fluid, and it's such a function of circumstances that it all goes back to training and not to be corny, but it goes back to that training in the early days of the academy where you provide the bedrock in constitutional terms, where officers accept that, they, that the exercise of their authority on the street is licensed by the Constitution. In the absence of the Constitution, they can't do what they do, really. And in real-time encounters on the street where you don't have the benefit of a computer to do a Google search and get an answer that says, react to Mike in this way, you go back to your your basic training, if you will, your constitutional basic training. Um, and you go through an analysis of hazard, of risk, uh, of reasonableness, um, and and I'm speaking in, in terms of an officer, or doing my best to speak in terms of an officer. I've never been a police officer, but somehow they, I think, do a good job of, of balancing the need to investigate and respond with a citizen's right to privacy and his or her place in things.